um, we're very happy to so we're very happy to have um, uh, Professor Eric Jones uh, here for our lecture series uh, this evening or this morning or afternoon, depending on uh, which campus you're at or, or elsewhere. Um, so Eric Jones is Professor of European Studies and International Political Economy at uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, the SICE Europe uh, campus. Um, he's the author of multiple books, including The Politics of Economic and Monetary Union, Economic Adjustment and Political Transformation in Small States, uh, and weary policemen, American power in an age of austerity, um, and the year the European crisis uh, ended. He's uh, edited and co-edited um, a number of books and special issues of journals on European politics and uh, political economy. Um, he's also had extensive commentary appear pretty often in the Financial Times, the New York Times, and other um, newspapers and magazines across Europe and uh, North America. Um, from September 2021, uh, he'll be on leave from SICE Europe. He'll be director of the um, Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University um, Institute. Um, he's also uh, an old friend of the Hopkins Nanjing Center. He's been a member of our joint academic committee and visited us here in Nanjing uh, multiple times. And uh, as part of our uh, effort to focus more on Europe, uh, uh, and Europe-China issues uh, here at HNC, um, we've invited him to speak on uh, today's topic, which is next generation EU pandemic crisis response and recovery. Uh, Professor Jones. Super, thanks a lot, Adam. I, I have to say one of, the, one of the hardest things that I'll give up when I go on leave to take this new position is uh, the chair I have on the Joint Academic Committee, which has been one of the great pleasures coming across in Nanjing uh, learning about the Hopkins Nanjing Center and also getting the opportunity to meet with colleagues uh, in China. As a matter of fact, the last time I was in China was in November 2019, and it was an outstanding trip where we got to meet uh, some terrific students, uh, some of whom actually ended up coming to SICE Europe. So it was very productive in that sense as well. The, the paper that I want to present uh, this evening evening, your time, this afternoon, my time, uh, is actually something that I wrote at the request of a, a Swedish think tank, a Swedish government think tank, trying to reflect a bit on, on how next generation EU or the EU recovery and resilience program that they've rolled out since last July is going to impact on the process of European integration. Uh, and, and it's something that they commissioned early in the autumn. I started the project uh, with a very skeptical mind frame and then took me a lot longer to finish the project uh, than I had anticipated. But by the time I'd finished, uh, it, it actually just came out in print two or three days ago. Uh, by the time I finished, I was much more optimistic. And so the arc of the story I wanna tell you is one that starts uh, in, in a kind of a dark pessimistic place, but then uh, slowly improves. I, I do have slides, so I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, those slides are available to anyone who wants. I'm also very happy to provide uh, copies of the paper or the URL so that you can download the paper. Uh, and, and for those of you who never tire of seeing this, I know it's gonna be recorded uh, by, by Adam and his team, but, but uh, there's also a, a, a version that I created of this talk for, for my students at SICE as well. So let me see if I can, uh, if I can find Next Generation EU and share that and put that into, um, one second, there we go. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the topic is the European Union's response to the pandemic and what it means for the future of Europe. Uh, by response to the pandemic though, I should say much more political and economic response than epidemiological response. Uh, this is a response very much uh, part of the the fate and future of European macroeconomic governance, which happens to be uh, my particular area of expertise. Uh, and the argument that I wanna make and the picture that I've, I've showed is a picture of an argument that was actually critical to this uh, between the, the gentleman on the left, who's Mark Rutte, who is the Dutch prime minister and the gentleman on the right, uh, who's uh, Giuseppe Conte, the prime minister of Italy. Um, and, <clears throat> and their argument very much shaped how the European Union responded. Um, and the argument that I wanna make on the back of their argument is that this response that they crafted together uh, as a compromise position has fundamentally changed the European integration process, both symbolically and institutionally. Now, the result is not gonna make Europe more 
like the United States, uh, all this talk of a Hamiltonian moment in that sense after Alexander Hamilton, the famous first secretary of the treasury in the United States, uh, who, who united all the state debt under the federal banner and so created federal uh, fiscal policy in the United States in a profound way. Um, that's not what happened in Europe. Uh, but what did happen in Europe is a very complicated and interesting agreement that's going to reinforce the role of the European Commission, the principal executive agency uh, that the European Union has. It's going to reinforce the role of the European Commission in, in ways that could strengthen the European Union as an actor, both domestically amongst the member states and abroad, uh, looking at, at what Ursula von der Leyen, European Commission president right now, calls a geopolitical Europe. Now, in order to make this argument, which is very uh, optimistic, I think, or upbeat in terms of the way I'm going to tell the story, uh, I, I'm going to have to break it down into five parts. Uh, the first part is going to be looking at Europe's initial response to the crisis, which I'll tell you uh, at the outset was pretty awful. Uh, and so that's the initial stumbling that Europe had. Um, then we're going to go into something that's a little bit more decisive. That's the intermediate phase of the response, by which I mean we're going to move from March to something close to April uh, April and early May. Um, then we're going to look at the important agreement that took place on Next Generation EU, which is the name of the Recovery and Resilience Facility that was created uh, in, in the context of these negotiations. That's from May all the way to the end of July. Um, we're going to look at the aftermath of that agreement, which unfortunately coincided with a very difficult second wave of the pandemic in Europe. Uh, and, <clears throat> and then we're going to interpret uh, the progress that's been made as Europe has come out of that second wave. Now, <clears throat> the initial stumbles uh, is a story that's very difficult to tell from an Italian perspective because it was one of the absolute low moments in Italy's relationship with the European Union. Uh, when the pandemic first broke in Europe at the end of February in <clears throat> in 2020, um, the first case in Italy on the 22nd of February, first confirmed case, uh, found Italy not embraced by the rest of the European Union, uh, but, but rather isolated. Um, as the case numbers began to mount, Italian doctors all across the country, uh, but particularly in the wealthiest part of the country in the north, found themselves without adequate protective equipment and without even adequate access to machines like respirators that would prove so vital in, in treating the most severe cases, which tended to be the cases that showed up at the hospital uh, first. Um, they ended up without that equipment and they couldn't get that equipment from elsewhere in the European Union. Indeed, there were very many cases of other European countries hoarding their own protective equipment and refusing to share uh, their ventilators and indeed begin engaging in a kind of a protective equipment or medical equipment nationalism that no one had expected. Uh, and, and the Italians already suspicious of Europe for a variety of reasons we could go into in the question and answer period, uh, really found their suspicions confirmed and their attitude toward uh, the European Union um, deteriorated quite dramatically. European solidarity was tested in, in that sense and found wanting. The situation was made worse, unfortunately, uh, as the European institutions tried uh, much more effectively to respond. And, and, and here I'm going to focus on a very unfortunate miscommunication that took place at the European Central Bank. Uh, the European Central Bank had changed leadership from an Italian president, Mario Draghi, uh, to a French president, uh, Christine Lagarde, and that change in the leadership took place at the end of 2019. Um, soon thereafter, Christine Lagarde tried to distance herself from Draghi's legacy in many respects, and she continued to do that all the way up through the 12th of March, which was the first big press conference for monetary policy that they had after the onset of the pandemic. Um, in, 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 in trying to distance herself from Mario Draghi, she unfortunately made a mistake in the minds of bond traders across Europe by suggesting that it was not the job of the European Central Bank to influence bond prices or the difference in bond prices between the more heavily indebted countries like Italy and Spain and the less heavily indebted countries uh, like Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, she said that's somebody else's job. 
Unfortunately, when, when she said that, what she signaled is that a commitment that Mario Draghi had made in July of 2012, a commitment that was responsible for making the most acute phase of Europe's sovereign debt crisis go away, had suddenly been withdrawn. And, and ironically, despite the fact that the European Central Bank and its governing council had actually responded quite innovatively uh, and quite dramatically to the onset of the pandemic by introducing a range of new or newly calibrated policy instruments that should have stimulated economic performance at a time when, when economies were closing down. Um, ironically, instead of that happening, what this miscommunication did uh, was send Italian bond prices straight through the floor and, and provoke a crisis uh, in, in, in Italian sovereign debt markets. So at the same time that Italy was being isolated in terms of medical equipment and all the rest, uh, Italy found itself being abandoned by the European Central Bank instead of bolstered by it. And that situation uh, was, was truly tragic. It was unfortunate uh, as a miscommunication, uh, but it was tragic in terms of the threat that it posed to the stability, not just of the Italian economy, but of the Euro area as a whole. Um, now, <clears throat> I say that uh, as a very tentative start, uh, but what you should know is that the European Central Bank recovered very quickly. Uh, Christine Lagarde went on to TV the night after that fateful press conference on the 12th and tried to correct her policy or communication error. Her chief economist, Philip Lane, wrote a blog the next day that explained that what she said was not at all uh, what she meant and that the European Central Bank was interested in ensuring that uh, governments had access to, to, to liquidity across the euro area. And then the European Central Bank rolled out on the 19th of March a new form of quantitative easing or direct asset purchases that had never been introduced before. It was a massive firewall of money, 750 billion euros that could be used flexibly to buy any country's sovereign debt should that country get into trouble. And this kind of a decisive action uh, is not something that we saw at the start of the global economic and financial crisis in 2007, 2008, to the same degree. This was even more decisive. It was certainly a dramatic correction uh, of the communications error, and it set the stage for a whole series of decisive intermediate steps in Europe's response to the crisis. So while there were those initial stumbles in the period from February to mid-March, um, Europe quickly regained its footing. Uh, it wasn't just the European Central Bank, the European Commission also played an important role relaxing the competition rules associated with governments giving aid uh, either to non-financial firms or to banks. And so ensuring that both banks and non-financial firms had adequate access to capital at a time when they knew they would experience losses, but also had adequate access to guarantees so that they could receive the kind of credit they required to carry themselves through what they knew was going to be a difficult economic period. Uh, and then the commission invoked what's called the general escape clause, which is a provision in both the preventative and the corrective arms of the macroeconomic policy coordination procedures that allows for the commission to reinterpret the rules for fiscal probity and, and to allow governments to run much larger deficits than they otherwise would be allowed to do. And so between the March the 13th uh, and March the 23rd, the whole policy regime and the commission's hands had changed to allow governments to intervene massively in a kind of a Keynesian fiscal way in order to prop up their economies. And between the monetary stimulus and the fiscal stimulus that was being introduced, um, there was already reason to believe that the situation uh, would not deteriorate as dramatically as one might have feared, given the initial hesitations I referred to earlier. Uh, having said that, there needed to be more done. And there was an immediate debate that looked at the possibility for all of Europe to use its credit raising capacity to borrow together so that countries like Italy and Spain, which were already heavily indebted, uh, would be able to get access to more credit and on more favorable terms. This is a very controversial prospect, uh, and, and that's why these intermediate steps are decisive and yet not overwhelming. Uh, nevertheless, it is true that very quickly on the 9th of April, the, the Euro group, which is the group of finance ministers for those countries that use the Euro as a common currency, 
was able to agree on three new initiatives. One was to allow the European Commission to borrow uh, up to 100, it says million, but it should be billion, uh, up to 100 billion euros to help backstop national unemployment and job protection schemes um, that allowed the European, <coughs> European Investment Bank to create a guarantee fund that would leverage 25 billion in capital uh, in order to, to provide up to 200 billion euros in credit guarantees for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, and then they unleashed the European Stability Mechanism, which is a specific mechanism that was created during the last crisis to backstop government finances. They liberated it to provide up to 240 billion in assistance that could be used to finance the health-related costs of the pandemic, uh, up to 2% of a country's GDP. Now, this is a big package, or so it looks at least on the surface, uh, of if you add up the credit guarantees, the, the promise of loans for unemployment insurance, and, and the pandemic crisis support from the European Stability Mechanism, that adds up to about 540 billion euros that was agreed uh, in principle on the 9th of March and then officially uh, by the European Council on the 23rd of April. So the 9th of April and the 23rd of April. Now these were controversial issues, but, but if you bear in mind the timescale that we're looking at here, from the middle of February to the middle of April, uh, we have a fully fledged crisis response in place, which is much better than took place uh, in the global economic and financial crisis, where it took literally years for them to come up with an effective crisis response combination. So this is a dramatic improvement. Uh, and, and much of that improvement, I should argue, uh, much of the decisiveness that we see in this intermediate phase uh, is to be credited to the lessons that Europe learned from the last crisis. Indeed, it's worth wondering uh, whether this kind of decisiveness would have been possible at all had the last crisis not taken place. Uh, but, but given the experience of the last crisis, it was reassuring to see Europe move so effectively to introduce these measures that would stop the free fall in the economic performance. Of course, it wasn't wholly effective um, because the free fall in economic performance uh, was only the intermediate stage in the long term, Europe would have to recover from this crisis. And so the other thing that was agreed uh, at, at that April 23rd European Council Summit was that the Commission would put forward proposals for how Europe would recover. And that's how we move from these decisive intermediate steps uh, to something much more important, uh, an agreement on how Europe would finance that recovery. Now, that agreement on the financing of the recovery brings us back to that debate I mentioned earlier about using all of Europe's credit raising capacity uh, in order to borrow money from the market so that those countries most adversely affected uh, could use that money uh, in, in ready supply and at favorable rates. Uh, but something on the 18th of May happened that was completely unexpected. And that's something that happened that was completely unexpected was a proposal from the French and German governments to offer the money that Europe borrowed collectively, not as a loan at favorable rates to those countries badly hit, but in the form of a grant. In other words, it would be given money uh, and, and that given money uh, would be used by the governments of those countries most badly hit to finance their recovery. Now, of course, this money doesn't come from nowhere. The money has to be paid back eventually by someone, and those someone are European taxpayers. So with the Franco-German proposal, what they proposed in effect was not just that Europe would raise money borrowing collectively in order to extend grants to those countries hardest hit by the pandemic, but also that Europe's, Europeans would raise taxes collectively in order to pay back the loans that they generated, that the loans would not be the responsibility uh, of those countries that use the money. Now, this proposal from the French and the Germans was revolutionary in many respects because of that principle of introducing new tax instruments to finance new collective spending that would benefit specific countries. Uh, and, and in the context of that innovation, it's unsurprising that there was some pushback. Uh, and the pushback came uh, in the form of a jointly signed non-paper, which is a, not a policy document, but a statement of principle uh, by the governments of the Netherlands, Austria, Denmark, 
and Sweden. And what they argued was that it's not possible for Europe to borrow collectively and then finance collectively the debt that they've raised in the way that the French and the Germans had proposed, that it would be more responsible instead for Europe to borrow collectively and then provide a loan, just as in that European Commission program to backstop unemployment and employment protection schemes, they would provide a loan to national governments that national governments would then be responsible for repaying. Uh, so where the French and the Germans had argued in favor of only grants, the Dutch, the Austrians, the Danes, and the Swedes argued in favor of only loans. Um, what the European Commission did was tried in a Solomonic way to split the difference, uh, adding a loan component to the grant component that the French and German governments had proposed beforehand. And the whole negotiations that take place between the 27th of May uh, in, in the end of July are negotiations about the balance between loans and grants, the degree of national responsibility that would be attached to any spending, how the oversight would take place, what tax revenues would be raised, and, and who ultimately would be the beneficiaries of this new form of spending. This negotiation is obviously complicated. Um, and when you think about the time frame involved, it was unbelievably accelerated, but given the nature of the crisis that everyone was facing, uh, the response was in many ways proportionate. By the end of July, although there was a long European Council summit, usually they last about two days, this one lasted uh, almost five, uh, although there was a long European Council summit, they were ultimately able to come up to an agreement. Uh, and the agreement represented a compromise between the Italians who were very much advocating uh, some kind of European solidarity along Franco-German lines and the Dutch who were advocating not an absence of solidarity, but a higher degree of national responsibility to ensure the governments paid back their debts. And the way they did this agreement was to bind the new recovery and resilience facility to the existing multi-annual financial framework, which is the seven-year budget uh, that is always negotiated uh, by the European Union on that seven-year basis, and that was due to be negotiated this summer. In any case, they added that new facility onto the multi-annual financial framework in order to create uh, what looked to be a 1.8 trillion euro budget to be spent out uh, over the next seven years. So often in the reporting from the time, you'll see that 1.8 trillion euro figure. But within that figure, what you should note is that 750 billion is the additional funding that they agreed. 360 billion of that would be loans, which was a concession to the Dutch, the Austrians, the Danes, and the Swedes. 390 billion would be grants. Uh, some of that money would be spent outright by the European Commission to focus on existing European projects. Other money would be allocated according to a needs-based formula to the governments of the member states. All of the spending would be focused on key European themes to promote a digital transformation, to ensure a green transformation as well, and to enhance the resilience of national and European economies. Uh, and, and all of that thematic focus and enhanced resilience would be underpinned by strict supervision uh, on the part of the European Commission, according to an equally strict timetable. Uh, all of the contracts need to be written by December of 2023. Uh, all of the money needs to be out the door by December uh, 2026. Uh, when you think about how much money we're talking about, um, this is an extraordinary feat. And that means that there needs to be a massive transformation in the way that national procurement is done uh, in, in national projects are supervised, um, but the promise is if they make those reforms and smooth the whole process of pushing money out the door, um, then they'll be granted with new financial instruments um, that will allow them to pay back the debts, taxes on things like non-recyclable plastic, uh, carbon emissions, uh, and other things that, that they believe they can use. Now, it, it's a complex agreement, uh, but it does marshal a significant amount of resources and it brings Europeans together. It was symbolically a hugely important thing. Uh, and in, <clears throat> when the Italian prime minister came home from that meeting, he was greeted as a national hero for his success in gathering European support to help Italy respond to the crisis. 
even the Dutch prime minister was able to go back and claim to his constituents uh, that the agreement was a fair one and, and that it would be preceded, uh, <clears throat> preceded and necessary uh, for the Dutch national interest. So everyone was agreed and popular conceptions of Europe strengthened as a consequence. Of course, you know, that kind of good news uh, can't last forever. Um, almost immediately, people began to look around and say, well, wait a minute, the money that's being on offer, this mix of grants and loans, to what extent is it actually worth taking up the loans because they're gonna add to the national debt? And, and, and wouldn't it be easier to take up the loans individually rather than borrowing the money from the European Commission, given how closely the European Commission is likely to scrutinize the way the money is spent? Already in October, the Spanish and Portuguese governments made it clear that they were not going to borrow the money that was being offered to them, although they would accept the grant money. Only the Italians seemed to be enthusiastic about receiving the whole of the package. And so questions began to be raised almost immediately. Uh, <laughs> and then at the same time, those questions extended to the ability of these governments to implement the kinds of reforms necessary in order to qualify uh, for the funding. Now, it's not just questions about next generation EU that were problematic. There were also questions about that intermediate package I alluded to. Remember, we talked about 540 uh, billion euros that was going to be offered in order to stabilize economic performance. Um, but nobody actually accessed the money from the European stability mechanism. Indeed, um, the Spaniards and the Portuguese and the Italians made it clear they were never going to access that money. And so the 240 billion that the ESM was supposed to have on offer was left on the table and never used. Uh, of the guarantees that the European Investment Bank put on the table in order to support borrowing by small and medium-sized enterprise, only about 40% of the capital was ever deployed. And that was by April, 2021. So a year later, they still hadn't used even half of the resources that were made available. The only thing that was fully used was the money to support unemployment and job protection by the European Commission, but that's just 100 billion out of a 540 billion euro package. So the initial package wasn't being used. It wasn't clear that the subsequent package would be able to be used either. And then there were divisions within the governing council of the European Central Bank about how much and how long they would be able to extend this bond purchasing scheme and all the other settings on the instruments that they deployed in order to provide what they call monetary accommodation, in other words, favorable financing conditions uh, by, by effectively uh, printing money. Now, the ECB's governing council was divided on those issues and those divisions uh, percolated all the way up into uh, December. The reason that those divisions were allowed to simmer rather than being settled by the ECB president is because the ECB president was also keeping an eye on the need for the member states to agree on what were called own resources for the European Commission. Because as much as we might worry about whether countries could spend the money that the European Commission was gonna make available, the fact of the matter is the commission couldn't even borrow the money in the first place unless there was some guarantee that new financial resources would be on offer uh, for that money to be repaid. And, and that guarantee was hard to find. Why? Because you needed unanimity to ratify. You needed every member state to ratify the creation of new, quote unquote, own resources, sources of tax revenue that the European Union could use to repay the debts that the European Commission incurred. Uh, and some countries argued that this money should not be agreed unless there was a bar put on the use of rule of law conditions uh, in, in monitoring the policies of the individual countries, specifically Hungary and Poland objected to the idea that the European Commission would be judging them on rule of law principles before allowing them to spend money under next generation EU. And, and in order to ensure that that would not take place, they said, we won't guarantee the tax revenue to raise the money in the first place. Uh, and, and so we had this weird rule of law conditionality debate. Um, then we had a subsequent debate on whether next generation EU was a one-off <clears throat> instrument that was created specifically for this pandemic or whether it represented a permanent increase in 
the institutional capacity um, that would represent a fiscal change. The Dutch obviously wanted this to be a one-off, but they were not alone in that suggestion. The Finns were equally determined that it be a one-off as well. Other governments like the French and the Italians were quietly suggesting that it could be a permanent feature, and so was the European Central Bank. And so in the tension uh, between institutions and national governments in the European Union, um, there was another reason to delay the ratification of the own resources decision. Um, these arguments unfolded far longer than anyone anticipated that was supposed to be wrapped up uh, in January or February, but instead extended all the way into May of 2021. And, and this is against the backdrop of the unbelievable death toll that was imposed uh, when the second wave began to crest. Almost as soon as we started to have these conversations about ratifying the own resources decision about divisions within the governing council of the ECB and, and about the slow take up of the intermediate decisions that have been made, uh, we began to see the case numbers rise in France, Spain, the United Kingdom, uh, Italy, even those countries that were less adversely affected by the first wave, like Germany, found themselves quickly inundated and under lockdown. So the situation in Europe was looking pretty extreme. Uh, and, and, and yet, and yet, although the disease was progressing in a terrible way and extracting a terrible toll on European society, um, the economic performance was actually more resilient than they might have anticipated. And it was more resilient, I would argue, uh, because of the way markets responded to the demonstration of European solidarity. Now, in order to make this argument, what I've done is put up um, the spread, which is the difference between bond <coughs> yields in three different countries, France, Italy, and Spain, and Germany. So that's the spread over Germany. And as the spread goes down, that means financing conditions for those three countries are actually improving uh, relative to German finance conditions. And German finance conditions were unbelievably generous. In fact, the German government was being paid to borrow money. It, it was borrowing at, at what was effectively a negative uh, rate of interest. Now, what you can see from this is that the European Central Bank, with the introduction of its pandemic emergency plan, only bought a short window of calm in, in the markets. The real calm that came in the markets came after the French and the Germans announced their desire to see grants be given to those countries most badly hit by the crisis. Uh, and that Franco-German recovery plan, followed by the long debate into the summer that I mentioned, actually coincided with an easing of financing conditions across uh, those weaker countries in, in, in the Euro area. And that was hugely important to the resilience those countries demonstrated uh, during that important second, second wave. Uh, and, <clears throat> and not only was that um, market confidence an important thing, but that symbolism that I talked about in July was important as well. People were not ready for a second wave in the sense that they had hoped that it, they would not have to face it, but they knew that there was a light at the end of the tunnel, and this shows up very clearly in the polling data. And, and, and at the same time, what we see is the European Commission being quietly strengthened with enhanced analytic capacities to monitor member state performance, uh, but also with an expanded treasury capacity uh, to, to borrow the scale on the scale and to manage the volume of debt that it will need to manage. And remember, uh, all this money has to be spent in six years. But one thing I didn't mention, it has to be repaid over the next 30. So for the next 35 years or so, the European Commission will have a huge and very active treasury operation that kind of institutional facility and the enhanced analytic capacity I mentioned, those things are not going to go away. Uh, and the strengthening of the European Commission, particularly relative to the European stability mechanism, means that in the next crisis, just as the last crisis informed this one, this crisis will inform the next. In the next crisis, it will be much easier and much more obvious uh, to rely on the European Commission in order to provide this common, uh, common funding. Now, there will be a fight over the new tax instruments. We're not quite sure how that is going to play out, uh, but we can see that there is agreement now on the own resources decision. There is agreement that some new instruments will have to be put in place. So the real fight is just going to be about what those instruments will be. And once those instruments are in place, it will be very difficult to pull them away again. So we'll see an enhanced fiscal capacity at the European level for the next 35 years as well. 
Now, all of this means that the European Union is going to come out of this not simply with a better uh, economy as a result of next generation EU, um, but also and crucially with a stronger institutional array, including critically a stronger European Commission. Um, the, the big question mark is whether the European Commission at some point in this evolution is going to have to pick a fight with the member states. You'll recall I mentioned on the 23rd of March in 2020, the European Commission activated what's called the General Escape Clause, which allows it to reinterpret the rules for macroeconomic policy coordination. Um, soon it will have to deactivate that clause, uh, probably with respect to the financial planning for 2023. Um, there needs to be a reform of European fiscal rules between now and then. Otherwise, the European Commission is going to find itself enforcing rules uh, with these new enhanced powers that it has that actually run uh, counter to the interests of European macroeconomic performance, something that nobody really wants to see. Um, so we need to figure out how that reform uh, of the European fiscal rules is going to take place. Uh, just to tie a knot, uh, I think what we're seeing as we interpret um, the progress that has been made is, is that both Europe and its member states have been strengthened and, and that strengthening is not something um, that's easily uh, going to go away. Um, so <clears throat> the conclusion is that Europe is stronger now than it was at the start of the pandemic uh, and, and the member states have the chance in the way they use the funds and in the reforms that they undertake uh, to become stronger and more resilient as well. Uh, I end this on an op optimistic note, but let's be fair. We're going to have to see how that progress unfolds in the next six months will be crucial. We'll know a lot by the end of the year when the Commission does its first review uh, of performance under next generation EU, something that we expect to see already in, in December. Hopefully, uh, during the intervening period, the pandemic will come under control in Europe that appears to be taking place on the back of the vaccination campaign, and the economic recovery will gain momentum as well. The most recent European Central Bank press conference suggested that that was likely uh, by the end of the year. Uh, let's hope their economic estimates are accurate. The work ahead is considerable, uh, but, and, and I'll just conclude on this note, there's real reason uh, to hope that Europe can manage to do better uh, at the end of this crisis than it did at the end of the last one, uh, and, and in doing so, present itself as a much more effective actor, uh, both domestically and on the world stage. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much. You've covered uh, quite a lot of ground there. Um, I guess we can open up for any uh, questions or comments people might have. Well, I'll, I'll get us started with one question I had. I mean, a lot of what you've been describing is focused on, you know, guaranteeing debt and on supervising expenditure and so on. I mean, the other um, dimension of fiscal union, in a sense, would be revenue. I mean, how far do you see that going um, sort of in, in, in the next few years in terms of generating common sources of revenue or, you know, the, the, the other side of sort of fiscal integration, as it were? Well, it's a good question. The, the only new source of revenue that there seemed to be any agreement about in July of 2020 was the idea of putting a national levy on non-recyclable plastic waste. Um, and, and that national levy wasn't a direct tax on non-recyclable plastic. What it was was just an estimate of how much non-recyclable plastic a country generated there was a discount depending on the industrial use of that plastic and, and, and the extent to which it was an intermediate rather than something of final use state. And then the government was just supposed to pay that amount of money. That's the only thing they could agree upon in principle. Um, they still haven't introduced the legislation necessary for that to operate in fact. Um, they talked about the carbon offsets. That legislation hasn't been moved either. Indeed, there's not even really been an agreement in principle on those issues. And then they talked about a digital tax, a tax on digital commerce. Um, that's even further down the pipe in terms of its evolution. So, so in that sense, I, I think one could be pretty cynical um, and, and less than enthusiastic about Europe's prospects, particularly since the whole debate about tax in Europe has been sidetracked by the American proposal to introduce an, a global minimum corporate tax rate, um, which has opened up a whole different conversation about 
what the rate should be, whether there should be exemptions for particular industries and how it should be managed across the European context, a conversation that's taken us mm -hmm. uh, completely off in a different direction. Um, having said that, they agreed the own resources decision and there's nothing that concentrates the mind like seeing a huge amount of money being borrowed that has to be repaid. Because if it's not repaid through new taxes, then it's going to be repaid through value added taxes and national contributions. And nobody wants to see their VAT rates go up. Uh, or it's going to be the monster that eats the European budget because it'll eat the own resources that already exist and so crowd out other European Union spending. And nobody wants to see that either. So to the extent to which the European Commission actually engages in the debt raising mm -hmm. exercise, we'll see the pressure for some agreement on tax instruments increase until finally something gives way. Mm -hmm. Do you see this interacting with um, Brexit and sort of filling the gap from the UK having been a net contributor before? Because I remember this was an issue sort of a year or two ago before the pandemic and then it I think fell off the agenda at least in terms of getting much, much coverage. But I mean, how is this interacting with filling that gap within the EU budget and how you know, different countries are sort of jostling for position on this? Um, I would say the interaction is bad. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the EU leaving actually took a big hole out of mm -hmm. a bunch of existing programs. Uh, and the member states have tentatively agreed on a formula for augmenting their national contributions in a transitional way uh, in order to fill that gap until they can, can reorganize spending priorities and hopefully bring the money back down to manageable levels again. Um, but next generation EU just completely preempted that conversation. Now we have this huge addition that's been put up. Their, their national contributions have gone up from 1.2% of gross national income to 1.4%. So it has gone up uh, to a certain degree. Um, and, and the big conversation is, okay, when are we gonna get back to normal? So, so we expect to see some reorganization of spending priorities, probably not in this multi-annual financial framework, but, but probably in the next one. Um, between now and seven years from now, we'll begin to see the adjustment take place. Mm -hmm. If next generation EU succeeds in stimulating economic performance and therefore growing the economy, um, maybe that adjustment will be less painful than it might otherwise would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone, anyone have any questions? I don't want to hog too much here. You can either type in the chat or raise your hand if you prefer. Eric, hey, it's John Urban. I have a question. Um, you were speaking of, you know, about essentially how this locks in a new role, like a treasury role for the European Commission for, you know, not the next five years, but for the next 30 years. Do you see, you know, once things return to normal in two, three, or at least hopefully <laughs> the next few years, you, know, you see like 10 years on um, as the commission takes on a bigger role, do you see, you know, like you uh, critics, you know, kind of using this as a, as a rallying cry to kind of, you know, uh, against the commission's expanded role and like you see unforeseen consequences um, in, in the mid to long term? Well, it certainly sets up an odd tension between the European Commission and the European Stability Mechanism. And the European Stability Mechanism has some very strong supporters out there. The recent reforms to the European Stability Mechanism, they agreed a new treaty for the European Stability Mechanism back in the spring of 2019. And it's taken from 2019 all the way through 2020 to get that ratified. And that new treaty came into place in February of this year. Um, the European Stability Mechanism now actually shadows the European Commission in terms of its uh, supervision of fiscal policy coordination. So the two organizations exist uneasily side by side. And there, John, I think you may, may have a point. People may look at it and go, well, why should we have two organizations that seem to be doing the same thing? Um, but, but unfortunately for the European stability mechanism, the ESM exists outside the treaty framework and the commission is central to the treaty framework. That means the ESM is oddly vulnerable in an odd sort of way because it's an intergovernmental organization that's attached to the European Union but not part of the European Union. And so despite the fact that it has very strong friends, the institutional position of the European Commission is stronger. Um, the other thing that, that puts the ESM on the back foot is that the European Commission will have to manage this debt for the next 35 years. And, and, and that means that 
<clears throat> whether we like European Commission to have treasury operations or not is not an issue. They have to have some entity capable of ensuring that they're rolling over debt as it matures across a range of different maturities um, in, in maintaining a mix of instruments out there to maximize uh, the, the credit available at the lowest possible cost. Um, and, and that means that they're going to have to have active treasury operations. It's as simple as that. So, so as much as it might engender conflict, um, that conflict is, is not going to result in any, any kind of institutional change. On the contrary, the commission will keep generating expertise. And, and, and then a last point on that. Uh, remember the SURE program, which is the one that provides loans um, for governments to backstop their unemployment and job protection schemes. That program is not controversial and other programs like that could be added along the way, which will only bolster the responsibilities of European Commission Treasury operations. So I suspect we're, we're not gonna hear the end of that story, no matter how controversial it emerges to be. Thanks so much, Eric. That's really, really interesting answer. Um, I have a slightly different question. I, I remember looking at the um, chart you had with the, the spread on the, the bond rates reflecting you know, perceived risk uh, of different economies with Germany as the, the, the kind of baseline there. Um, over, over the last, I guess, 10, 15 years or since the beginning of the, the, the Euro, how much has that spread narrowed? I mean, is, is the perception of the relative risk of these economies narrowing over time? And the, re the reason that I ask that is because it seems that, I mean, you can look at this from either direction, right? Either that these kinds of solidarity mechanisms um, reduce the sense of a, a, a spread and risk between different economies because they're all in the same boat together or, or moving into the same boat together. But if you look at it from the other direction, to the extent that that perceived difference in risk narrows, it actually may reduce some of the resistance to, to sharing risk, right? If the, the gap is not actually so, so wide. I mean, how, do, how do you see those, those long-term trends and whether these kinds of things actually may reduce some of the sense that one is taking on um, the obligations of less sound economies? So that's a really good question, Adam. And it, it's revealing about the evolution of Europe's economic and monetary union. When the single currency was created in 1999, um, the spreads across long-term sovereign debt. So we always talk about the spread in, in the context of 10-year uh, benchmark sovereign debt. The spreads across this 10-year benchmark sovereign debts had already collapsed to below one half of 1%, right? So if a basis point is one one hundredth of a percent, they had fallen below 50 basis points across the euro area, including after 2001, uh, Greece, right? So, so Greece paid 50, fewer than 50 basis points, uh, more than Germany in order to borrow money. Um, <clears throat> if you were to compare that to Greece in 1991. In 1991, Greece paid, what, about 24 percentage points, right? So that's 2,400 basis points compared to 50 basis points, right? So that's how much bond markets had converged in terms of pricing uh, across that period from 1991 to 2001, for example. Um, in 2007, um, those spreads start to widen out Again, and the, the crisis that we conventionally talk about as the European sovereign debt crisis extends from about 2009 to 2012, where they blow out to be pretty big. Italy's spread in 2012 over the summer was something around 350, 400 basis points. Um, and so that was big, right? Compared to 45 to go out to 400 was big. They've been trying to bring those spreads back down again um, unfortunately, the, the progress is never permanent. And this is the issue that we've been facing since 2012, is that there are moments of tension where the spreads widen and then they have to fight hard to bring them back down. And they've never gotten the spreads for Italy over Germany, for example, uh, below consistently below 100 basis points, for example. I mean, it's, it's still trading at about twice what it did in the first eight to 10 years of the euro, right? Um, and, and so in that sense, I think the risk premium attached to Italy has increased structurally, and, and that is not going to go away. Um, what you saw in that figure that I showed is that it ballooned out to about 250 basis points and then came back down to where it's about 100 
right now. Uh, it's in fact, in the last few weeks, it's been increasing again as there's been pressure, a lot of sell-offs at the long end of the bond market. Um, and that's one of the things that the European Central Bank is, is trying to mitigate. I see there's a question in the, the chat here. Let's see. Is there any obvious reason why the guarantees for businesses had such a low take up when national guarantees are easier to access? Was there no need for these guarantees as financing conditions are still quite favorable even without guarantees? Um, no, the guarantees were absolutely essential because financing conditions were favorable, but, but the criteria for getting access to the financing conditions, to the favorable financing conditions, in other words, the loan restrictions put on by the banks would have been very high if the guarantees hadn't existed. Um, so, so you could get really good loans if you qualified and nobody would qualify. Um, the, the guarantees made it easier for country uh, companies to qualify, uh, but, but, but then you have to ask, you know, well, if you're a company, why would you want to borrow, right? I mean, you're not going to borrow to invest until you know when the investment is going to become profitable because anything that you borrow to add onto your debt pile has to be repaid and it has to be serviced in the meantime. Uh, and, and you're not getting any revenue because the economy is shut down. So we've seen, and this still shows up in the ECB's, um, uh, ECB's financial survey, um, <clears throat> we've seen that, that demand for credit is just falling off. So even if you put the guarantees on, the demand falls off. And, and a lot of the guarantees that were used initially were used to, to cover things like payroll. Uh, but, but what's happening is employers are like, I don't want to borrow to cover payroll because if I borrow to cover payroll, I'm just going to have more debt that I'm going to have to finance and repay in, with or without the guarantee. So they're trying to figure out ways to shove people into unemployment instead. In many countries, like in Italy, it's unlawful to make your workers redundant. Um, so you put them into a, a furlough scheme that's government financed. But as soon as that, that legal prohibition against unemployment is lifted, they're gonna push these people out of furlough and into unemployment. And so we're looking at that particular cliff edge. And, and it's only after they get through that restructuring that, that they'll start to think about investing again. Uh, and, and those investments will be when they'll start to take up, uh, take up the, the credit guarantees, hopefully. Um, it may be, though, that the credit guarantee schemes have run off by that point, in which case they'll have to have uh, the qualification on their own merits. Any other question? Uh, how do you see this interacting with the, the landscape of parties in power in different countries? Um, I mean, some of these, these narratives about fiscal responsibility tend to map um, better onto some you know, left or right-leaning parties being in power in different um, key economies. Uh, I mean, the, the German elections coming up, I mean, all of these other possible ways this could, could shift. I mean, do, do you think that those party alignments um, uh, would influence this narrative? I mean, for example, suppose if you had a more, you know, right-leaning fiscally conservative government in Italy and a more left-leaning government in Germany. I mean, would this change some of the, the narratives and, and positions on this kind of issue? Uh, you know, I think that's a really good question. Everybody seems to be accepting of the need to borrow right now. Mm -hmm. So in Germany, everybody accepted that for 2020, they could not apply the debt break. Um, and they would borrow as much money as they needed to keep the economy going. Um, and then everybody sort of switched almost at the same time, except for perhaps the Green Party, um, and began to advocate returning to the old rules for fiscal probity, including the, the black zero, so that eventually they get, they get to a balanced budget again. And that includes the left-leaning Social Democratic Party, right? Um, and, <clears throat> and so, so I'm not sure it's a left versus right question. Um, in, <laughs> even in Italy, it doesn't seem to be a left versus right question. Uh, it, it seems to be much more of a who's going to pay the taxes eventually kind of question. Um, and, and where the left and the right differ is on the tax burden that will be pushed onto industry at some point in the future, or whether it should be shared across households or funded by by somebody from outside the country. Um, so yeah, I'm still not sure it's a left-right issue. Even in the United Kingdom, um, where Boris Johnson's Conservative Party, um, what's interesting is, is how freely they appear to be spending money. When, when 
prior to, to Johnson becoming prime minister, the Conservative Party was, uh, was always addicted to the rhetoric, at least, of austerity. Um, and, and that rhetoric of austerity appears to have vanished uh, in some respects. The, the, the other interesting aspect of your question is how has the pandemic affected incumbents? Um, and, and the incumbency effect, I think, is confused by, by the vaccination politics. Because anybody who's been lucky enough to be the incumbent over a success, during a successful vaccination campaign uh, can do no wrong, it strikes me. Um, and anybody who's been unfortunate enough to have their incumbency end uh, just before the vaccine, vaccination campaign begins to gain momentum uh, is, is going to find themselves out of office. Um, so I, I'll be interested at the end of this vaccination campaign how many policy mistakes a successful vaccination campaign will have erased from public memory. Blame usually tends to last longer than credit in politics, I, I imagine. <laughs> we'll see when the, the dust settles, I guess. Okay, um, we're almost at the one hour mark. Any, any final question from, from anyone? Okay, um, we'll be posting the video on the, the Size Events website in, in due course for, for people to look at as well. But um, thank you very much for, for coming. This is, uh, I think, a, a good testament to being able to do these kinds of cross-campus events. So hopefully we can uh, have more of these uh, once life get back, gets back to normal. And uh, Eric also made me promise that doing this event would not mean that he could not come to Nanjing in person at some point uh, in the future. So we'll certainly look forward to hosting you here uh, again, hopefully not too far away. Look forward to coming. Thank you so much for having me, Adam. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Eric. Thank you have all for coming. Okay. Bye, Bye, guys. Bye.